so hi everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for having me, um, and thank you for uh, actually the intro. So I don't need to intro myself. Yes, my name is Joachim Kutner. I co-founded a company called Magento. Some of you heard of it, which is great. And I was the CTO. I actually led that uh, project um, from inception. It was an idea that I had with a small team of uh, developers at Magento. Um, and I just want to say, I just came back from Japan where we did an event uh, more about open source. And a room of about 500 people asked if anybody knows Magento, and nobody knew what Magento is. So luckily, some people know what it is here, and that's always uh, nice. So um, I basically left Magento uh, after eight years there, so since creating the company, uh, pretty much shortly after the acquisition by eBay. Um, and I felt like, you know, maybe it's time to yeah, actually create a new company. It was too soon for me. I really had a lot of more energy to create nicer products or, be or other products. And luckily for me, other people started leaving uh, Magento as well. So I was joined by uh, Jari Carter and Dima Soroka, uh, both who I worked with at Magento. Uh, Dima was the lead architect on the project when we started it, myself, him, and two other developers. And a lot of the developers from Magento actually joined us as well. Um, we found out that a lot of the core team started working with us. We had a lot of the ECG team work with us. So we had a really good team that knew Magento, um, and that was great. We actually were lucky enough also to be joined on the executive teams by uh, Mori Danino, which led the Magento Go project, and uh, Michael Baselov, which is here with me today, which is our VP of engineering leading the Oro Commerce project. And last, uh, Roy Rubin, my uh, previous partner, joined us at Oro, and he's acting as an advisor of uh, strategy and marketing right now. So we started the company. We wanted to do what we know best. We do services. We started doing services around Magento. We knew Magento. We loved the ecosystem. We loved the open source approach that we created there. And that allowed us to build a, a company around doing services around Magento project. And we did many of these um, implementations off Magento, and that allowed us to actually build a successful company pretty fast, like many other companies in the ecosystem. And that was great. But we always felt like maybe it's time to actually work on our own products as well. So we took a lot of the money that we made from uh, services business around the Magento platform and created a new uh, product line that we are mostly going to talk about today. Um, so we're going to just give you an overview of these products, but also talk a little bit about our strategy and what made Magento and how we are approaching these uh, products as well. So in terms of vision, who, who do we want to work with when we build products? What we learned at Magento and what we are doing right now with Oro is that the mid-market, where actually the, what you, we, we call SMBs, uh, is an amazing market to kind of target. If you work with these kind of SMBs or mid-market, as we call it here, it's a great bunch of companies because they are successful because they're innovative, because they create some tools or some solutions that are working and growing. And these kind of companies, they tend to be very kind of on the edge of technology. They cannot really find tools that work for them off the shelf. On the other hand, they don't want to necessarily pay millions of euros in implementations. So, but they still need tools that work for them. They need tools that don't adapt to their needs. They need tools that, uh, that they can actually change and manipulate to do what they need. And we actually uh, can uh, add to this some uh, statistics that some of the um, analysts comes with. And it's say, you know, when it comes to business application, about 50% of solutions are actually created as homegrown custom solutions, not as off-the-shelf solutions. So that's something that really helps with the kind of vision of what we want to do. We want to build tools that help companies be more successful, run their businesses in a better way, be more in, uh, have more innovation when it comes to how they're using the technology. And we want technology that works for them. And specifically, we chose to focus on CRM and B2B e-commerce. And I just want to mention that at Magento, it worked amazingly well when we used open source. And open source for us at Oro is more of a strategy. It's not necessarily a philosophy or religion like a lot of people think about or so, uh, open source, where open source is only the way you want to work because you want to share everything. No, we're a for-profit company, but we believe that our best strategy is actually releasing our products under an open source license. And that allows us to uh, be on the market, be a global company. Very, we're a pretty small company today, uh, headquarters in Los Angeles, but we are able to have customers all over the world use products that are, they kind of um, localize to their needs, use them in, for specific industries. And we use that because we develop open source uh, products. 
But that also gives to this kind of mid-market um, space the ability to kind of adapt or adopt a product to their needs because of the flexibility that the open source gives them. When there's no limits on what you can do with the product and there's only limits of your uh, whatever you want to actually invest in it, you can use the open source products and actually see how they're built, use that technology and adapt it to what you need the product to do. And that comes through customizations, through extensions, etc. So open source allows the mid-market, the companies that are actually innovating and creating the new business models, etc., to use the tools to, for what they need. And that also allows them to maintain a lower total cost of ownership. If the, if the product is developed in open source, it usually ends up being a bit cheaper because you rely on open source libraries, you rely on code that is not going to be proprietary or uh, cost any licensing fees, so you can reduce the total cost of ownership of the product. And that's also true for development. You can develop with any number of uh, companies that provide services around this platform. That might be partners or might be actual vendor or it might be your own team that you want to invest in and have customers that are developers, sorry, that are working on this product. So that allows them to actually keep a lower cost of ownership with full flexibility and the ability to actually uh, create tools that work for them. And the last thing that's exciting about, about open source is that an ecosystem usually evolves around an open source, an ecosystem of a community of developers, of an ecosystem of merchants or businesses that are using the applications, partners that are creating solutions on top of it. And this ecosystem, when it grows, when it becomes more successful, your open source project usually grows as well. So it's something that works for everybody. So that's why we're really passionate about using open source as a strategy to building products. And this is also true to how we develop technology. If we look at the technology stack that we, or our approach to, sorry, to developing the technology, we use open source tools, right? We, we have, um, and I think I skipped, yep, sorry about that, the, the clicker is fast. So um, when it comes to how we build the technology, we keep these in mind, right? So being extendable, being able to extend our products is something that is key to the way we develop the products. It means that we know that the way we are building the product is not necessarily how the end user is going to consume it or use it. So we have to keep that in mind. We're adding the flexibility in multiple points. We always say, okay, how do we think people can use it and how do they need to extend it in a flexible way? But with that, we also learned that just giving tools that are open source, flexible, customizable, sometimes come with a price of maintainability. People find it very hard to maintain the, these uh, solutions and usually what happens in open source, they kind of fork away from the original product. So we actually learned that lesson already and we are maintaining a lot of the uh, kind of things that you would expect from enterprise software, even applying it on open source, so using uh, object-oriented kind of approach, using uh, and providing a test suite where people can test uh, their uh, product as they customize it to make sure if any changes or modifications they made actually gonna cause any problems to the platform. So we develop it, we, we share it with everybody so they can use it for their products. And performance, again, same importance, right? It cannot just be fully functional, it has to be performant. Especially with business application, they deal with a lot of data, sometimes a lot of users. So performance is something we constantly keep in mind when we develop the product and part of our test suite. So we test any new features to see if they impact the performance of the product. And security, of course, is as important. Without security, you basically cannot um, release a product that deals with sensitive data. So security is something we have a dedicated team to that actually looks at. And we benefit a lot from open source because the product is used so many times and by so many people and we're getting a lot of uh, vulnerability tests done on the product, we actually get that feedback and we uh, patch any security issues that we find. When it comes to deployment, the new way of deploying, and I had a few conversations already here today, we should not stand in the way of the product being deployed in any kind of environment. It can be on-premise on your own servers, it can be in some cloud, or it can be on our cloud, our optimized our cloud. We want people to consume our products in the most, in any way, sorry, that they would actually want to. And I just showed you already the slide, but this is the stack that we're relying on. And again, for our approaches, we're using the best of breed when it comes to open source uh, technologies. And uh, we're using PHP, MySQL, Postgres, SQL for Enterprise Edition that we have. Symfony 2 is the framework, and we're really good uh, with that decision. We're very famous for using Zen framework for Magento, but uh, Symfony 2 is uh, probably the most adopted framework right now, and I think a lot of adoption here in Germany as well, so it's a good thing. Uh, but everything else we're using are libraries that are used, uh, surprisingly enough, in enterprise product as well. So we're relying on these libraries, relying on these open source tools to build our own open source product. 
So quickly, I'm already getting here that I only have 10 minutes. So um, with Oro uh, Platform, that's our first product that we created. And the idea came from when we observed how people were actually using uh, Magento. And we were actually surprised to see that we developed a B2C e-commerce application. But we found out that a lot of companies, a lot of developers were trying to use it to create any other application that you can imagine. Not, nothing to do with e-commerce. They were creating, for example, community sites, uh, social networks, right, we call it today. Uh, they were creating file sharing sites, video sharing sites, blog systems. When we started talking to these developers and companies and asked them, why are you using Magento for this kind of application? What made you do that? The answer was that they, they looked for, you know, to create their own application, and they looked at the feature set of Magento, and they said, wow, a lot of what we need is already done here. So why don't we just start from Magento, remove some of the features we don't need, like for e-commerce, and use everything else, like user management, um, navigation, et cetera. So, they did that, but the problem was that we kind of very specialized Magento very high up to be a, uh, specifically a B2C e-commerce application. And that caused that a lot of people that wanted to use Magento for other things, other applications, made them waste a lot of time and money to actually decouple the features and start from scratch. So we said, maybe this time we do something different. We're going to create a new application. We know that a lot of businesses create their own um, their own solutions and uh, custom solutions. Why don't we help them? Why don't we make sh uh, try to make our ecosystem even bigger? And that's what we did. We created a new layer. We call it the Oro platform. It's a general purpose business application platform. It's completely open source under the MIT license. So there's no limitations on what you can do with it. And what we basically did, and I'll get as technical as I'm going to get here, is that we have the code level where the framework sits, and we have the application. And if we draw a line in between them, that's where the platform sits. So it's kind of a set of features that are generally purpose that every business application will probably use a big set of them, if that makes sense. So that's what we did. We created um, this Aura platform. We released it. Some of the features that you'll have there is what you would expect. For example, a user and permission management module that allows you to create um, and interact with users, create different roles, different permissions, this extensive uh, ACL feature that you can create a lot of different roles with different permissions and how people are interacting with it. And it's reusable. So when you create your own application, you already get that for free. So you just create your application, your business domain, but you get user management done for you for free. Global search is another thing that we found out that a lot of business applications need. They tend to have a lot of data, a lot of records, People need a very fast way to locate those records. So we have this global search module where you, when you create a new module or new feature, you just register it and you automatically get this global search uh, feature. Entity management, a lot of business applications work with entity management. So we build this engine where you can create custom entities from the UI, actually, you don't even need to be a developer. You manage what attributes every entity has, and then you need to be able to work with it. So we have a workflow engine that allows you to kind of set the way that your users are interacting with the data. And we have a report engine, for example, where you can actually then pull the re uh, data out in a report format. So all this is built for any application that wants to be built with the Oro platform. Adding to that navigation, easily to uh, create menus, uh, system configuration where people can configure some of the, or users that are using your system can configure some of the preferences. Um, and we invested a lot in UI UX. So we have a team of UX designers that are actually making reusable uh, features on the front end because we know that in the end, the people that you have to use these uh, applications are people that are sitting in front of a monitor for eight, nine hours, depending on the work laws in your country. But they have to look at this application and they have to work with it efficiently. So we invested a lot, not only in a pretty looking uh, interface, but also a very uh, robust in terms of efficiency and how it, it's used. And these are reusable components that you can build on top and use them for your own applications as well. So uh, we were actually committed to this product. We are investing a lot in it. Um, and we have a very long roadmap of features that we have. Um, and this is a very short list, like uh, adding to the API, field level ACL, so a user can actually have different permission on the field level, not only on the record level. Um, performance optimization constantly, and then workflow automation. We're actually exposing, we have a very robust workflow engine right now, but we're exposing more of it from uh, kind of a drag and drop UI, so people can do it from the admin as well. So we started noticing that a lot of companies started building their own custom applications on top of our platform, and that was great. But we also started finding that our companies are building new products on top of the Oro platform. So they're trying not only for their own use, but actually products that they're trying to either sell or just create as an open source. 
And some of them are listed here. Of course, Oro CRM and Oro Commerce, we, as we say in the US, eat our own dog food. So we use our Oro platform to create our own products. But Akenio, for example, an open source PIM, product information management system, it was developed on top of the Oro platform. The Amanta Desk, they're up here with Eltrino. It's a ticketing system like Zendesk, open source ticketing system, created on Oro platform. And Timelap, right here, and uh, Morello, which is an open source ERP system that's being developed on top of the Oro platform as well. And this was what we, we kind of hoped for, right? We knew that people are going to use it, but the fact of what happened in real life is that what we noticed in both Oro CRM and Akinio about two years on the market right now is that if a, some customer would be interested in Akinio, a few weeks later, uh, they would call also for CRM. And vice versa, if they started with CRM, in a few weeks or months, they would call and ask for Akinio as well. So what happened was that every application started generating this ecosystem around it, and that was great, of developers, of community of users, et cetera. But then they started interacting and intersecting because they found out that you need to build deeper integrations between these uh, products. So it became like a multi-dimensional ecosystem where the developers of one application actually start working on other applications as well, building extensions for two or more applications. And it became really, really interesting. And we're starting to see this, and we're investing more in Oro Platform to actually enable people to deploy multiple Oro Platform applications in the same environment. And that will reduce a lot the integration effort that needs to be done, because you can then use, for example, the same user engine to run all your users across these applications. You don't need to create any integration. But this is something we're definitely investing in and are really excited about. So again, if you have an idea or you want to create a new product, be disruptive to a specific industry, look at the Oro platform and see maybe it's something that you can use for your own uh, needs. So the, the next product we came up with, again, we, we knew the Oro platform is a good idea, but you know, it's something that we kind of was, um, you know, we didn't know how good it will have, uh, be or how good it will be adopted. So we wanted to create a product that has a bit more uh, usefulness for uh, merchants or customers or our potential customers. And we kind of, again, looked at the, our history and try to see what, what did our customers look for when we were working with them on Magento? What were they asking us to add in terms of uh, features? And one thing that everybody that we worked with was asking for was actually a way to manage their customer, a customer relation management tool. So like every developer, we went to Google, put in the term CRM, and got a long list of results. And guess what? Most of those results were called CRM, but what they actually did was managing a pipeline, right? Managing what we call leads, Con tracking, converting them to opportunities, and then tracking how many sales you have. But that's not necessarily what our customers needed. They needed a way to manage customers that were buying sometimes online or sometimes coming into their store, and they don't treat them as leads and opportunities. They're not necessarily a sales uh, organization working with leads and opportunities. And, and add to that that our customers, our merchants that we worked with, were not a single point of touch with customers. They had multiple ways of selling to customers, multiple points of interaction with the customers, and that means that they need a tool that will be a, allow them to actually scale that. And not to have a single point of interaction, but multiple. For example, somebody buying online, and from your, maybe your eBay store or your Amazon store, maybe they come and walk into your brick and mortar store, maybe they're calling your call center, right? Maybe they're interacting through social networks. So all these points of interaction in today's modern world needed to be controlled and supported in some application. So again, the term CRM is used very loosely today with uh, sales marketing, I mean, sorry, sales uh, pipeline management tools, but not really when it comes to the, today's uh, kind of uh, omni-channel or multi-channel merchant. So we looked at the space. We, we like to do some research. We don't necessarily jump in and say that's what we're going to do. So we looked at the research, and first of all, as a technology company, we want to see, do people spend money on these kind of technologies? And if you look at the uh, analyst, so Gartner in this case says that um, about $20 billion was spent on technology related to CRM in 2013, and they expect it to almost double to almost $40 billion in 2017. So the, people spend a lot of money on uh, CRM applications. So that's interesting for us and for our ecosystem. But then when we looked how this actually market is, uh, is broken up, we found out, of course, not surprising that Salesforce, SAP, and Oracle are kind of the leaders in this market. But what we like is this orange part where more than 50% of the market is actually under the other label. And when we dug into what does it mean other, 
we found a lot of this kind of small solution, one size fit all SaaS that are really good for you know managing two, three, maybe five to ten sales people and tracking their uh, pipeline. But most of these 50 percent are actually companies that build their own custom solutions for uh, their uh, client relation management tools. And that's what we like, because we build flexible tools for these kind of companies. And again, if you just look at how this uh, market space also kind of breaks apart when we look at total cost of ownership versus flexibility, and flexibility is on the bottom, we see that, again, we have a lot of players in the low market, very cheap, but very not flexible. It's a one size fit all, really good at managing leads and opportunities. And as you need more capabilities, as you move up market, price goes up almost exponentially. And uh, pricing of Salesforce, uh, et cetera, they become very, very expensive to do some customization and own it, right? So when we designed our serum, we said no limits on flexibility. Should be able to do anything you want with the system, but maintain a reasonable cost of ownership. So you don't have to break the bank, as we say, to actually create the solution that works for you. And quickly, I'll just run through some of the approaches we have in the product. So multi-channel, we talked about how important it is. We have developed every feature with multi-channel in mind. And here's just one example is our dashboard. It's not only showing you uh, what you would expect in every other serum like we have on the top part. I know it's hard to see, but you can test start on our demo. Um, you have a, a B2B pipeline management. You see a pipeline with leads and opportunities like you'd expect, uh, track the performance of uh, different sales reps, that's fine. But we also have a pretty easy way to configure a new uh, dashboard, for example, for your online channel or your e-commerce channel. And you'll see how many new customers you had, who are those best customers that you're working with. You, the funnel is built in a way that it shows you all the people that kind of visited your store, maybe they actually browsed, how many of them actually added to cart and how many actually converted to order. So even the pipeline view is per your channel, per whatever you want to measure there. So that's a, kind of the approach we took about every other feature in Aura Serum. And that allows us to build what everybody's talking about, the 360 degree view or the true 360 degree view of your customer by putting all of them together in a single account view that's very easy to extend per adding more and more channels you can actually get the true interactions that you have with every given uh, customer, and it adds up, right? So as you discover more uh, points of interaction with customers, you can add them to the account view, and we, once you have an integration to bring the data, it's very easy to scale this to show, for example, your e-commerce channel, your e-build channel, et cetera, under a single account. But we also saw that people are using it in different ways. For example, more and more uh, companies today want to look at household or families as an account to see what's the true value that the family brings to you because you're spending so much on marketing it for different ages, for different um, uh, people in the family. So we have a lot of users that have this view that shows them household views and it shows them family and says this family, the dad, the mom, and the kid, they all shop with you on, across different channels and you can get this view. We have merging rules so you can merge these uh, accounts uh, through our processes by applying some rules on that. So that's actually what we did with that. Marketers. Poor marketers. Marketers never seem to be uh, having the right tools to work with. And we believe that what we built here allows marketers to get the better visibility into the segments that they need to kind of interact with. So there are very expensive tools that do really good BI, but if you need something a bit more simple for your marketers to kind of get an insight of what's happening, we have our own tracking uh, kind of system that actually tracks uh, all the performance of a customer or a campaign for that matter. Um, and it, since you own that data, you might even be able to use it. So we'll see how the rules kind of apply in Europe about that. But the idea is that you can track a full campaign and see who are the customers that actually converted from a campaign. Not only how much a campaign converted, but who are the actual customers that the campaign converted to. So for example, if you're offering a free shipping uh, coupon or a promotion, you know which customers like free shipping versus which customers like 25% off. And you can look at this in the data and your marketers can actually interact and learn this data. And workflows, it's our approach to everything. We know that, like we said, no two businesses are alike when they work with their data. So everything is workflow based. Again, we have out of the box a few workflows configured, but it's easy to configure more of them. Just some of that we have, of course, is the uh, pipeline leads opportunities uh, converting to orders. But we also have, for example, abandoned shopping cart workflow, where you can work on the shopping carts that you're getting from your e-commerce channel and say, well, if a shopping cart is more than 1,000 euros, I want the sales rep to kind of follow up if he can, if we have any contact information and see what happened there. And that's something that we, we kind of taking to, again, to everything we're doing there. We have uh, follow-up on orders. Uh, you know, if an order is more than 500 euros, you want a personal touch, maybe uh, pick up the phone and ask if everything was delivered properly. You get investing in the relationship with the customer. So 
again, these are just some examples, but it's a workflow based on our workflow engine, and you can configure those as many as you want into the system. And again, roadmap is uh, pretty big. We have a lot of things coming here, and this is just a short list. I won't cover this because we're starting to run out of time. But uh, if you want to check it, it's on our website, and you definitely can uh, see what else we're working on. OK, and in open source, we track uh, downloads. That's what we do. Um, so the product is on the market, like I said, for about two years now. Uh, it was downloaded over 80,000 times, so that's kind of nice. Uh, but what we actually like more is we're tracking how many people are logging into the system, right? And how many times logging in from the same place or on the same system. And uh, we actually reached a number that's over 50,000 live instances or active instances, as we call it, of our CRM. And that's a great number for us because it it's, means that a lot of people are downloading and actually trying to use it. So uh, that's all we can track in open source, unfortunately. But that's the numbers we're working with. And also, the, the adoption is kind of all over the world. I'm sorry for showing Russia as part of Europe here, our marketing uh, in US. You know, anything uh, across the Atlantic is Europe for us, or Africa. So, um, so in this case, uh, Europe actually wins, and it's the number one market for us. But, uh, but the nice thing to take from here is that uh, everything, uh, that our product is adopted globally, right? So US, I mean, North America, Europe, Russia, uh, and even Africa. We get installations all over the world, and this is because of open source, guys. We cannot do it if we would do a proprietary software, right? The fact that this pro project is being translated to over 60 languages, is being adopted in almost every country we can think of, is because of open source. So again, that's how we do this. Price, just if you care, we have a free community edition. You're free to do whatever you want with it almost. Um, but if you want to use our enterprise edition, it just gives support. It gives uh, better tools to scale data if you're working with a lot, a lot of data or many, many users in the system. And we try to keep it simple. So it's a simple $59 per user, five user minimum per month uh, price. And it's regardless if you use it on-premise or if you want to host it with our Oro Cloud. So it's the same price. Again, very, very simple. If you need help implementing it, here are a list of uh, partners all over the world. Some of them are providing here uh, support in Germany for our German market. Right. Yeah, and here is a list of customers. Again, um, the interesting thing to look at this is that these customers come from complete different industries, complete different verticals inside the industries. We have a lot of e-commerce sellers, but we have here pharmaceutical companies. We have uh, for, uh, financial institutions. We have financial advisor company here. So. Complete different markets, complete different industries, complete different uh, things because of the flexibility we built into the product. And this has a lot to do with this open source approach. So the last product I'm going to talk about today is OroCommerce. It's the latest addition to our uh, suite of pro open source projects. Um, and our commerce comes again from the need of what we learned working with merchants, with online merchants. We started getting more and more demand for, for implementing not traditional B2C uh, websites on Magento, but the requirements started looking like more B2B requirements. Business selling to another business online. So we said maybe something is happening here, right? And when we thought about the B2B uh, kind of space, B2B traditionally was done uh, pen and paper, meetings, right? Um, but like every industry, as technology started kicking in, they started using phones. And then uh, fax machines were introduced, so they started selling through fax machines, so people would submit fax orders. But like every other industry, it's trying to optimize itself. It's trying to move to the new technology. And finally, they found the internet, right? And a lot of these businesses want to start transacting um, uh, business to business transactions over the internet. So this is something we started observing, that people are trying to go online, but they're trying to find the tools that works for them. And the first place that they will look is for an e-commerce platform because they think that they're just going to do an e-commerce implementation. The problem with this is immediately run into issues. The features that are developed for B2C e-commerce are not the feature set that need to be there for B2B. And to get B2B right, it has to be a product that took that into mind and invested in building from the grounds up these uh, kind of features. So again, just quickly, we do some assumptions, but we go and look at data. And how big is this market? So we actually were extremely surprised to see that uh, Forrest and Sullivan found that about $5.5 trillion in B2B online transactions were already done in 2012. And they expect that to grow to over $12 trillion in 2020. So this is already huge, and it's just getting much, much bigger. So a lot of people are already trying to transact and do B2B online transactions. 
and they spend on technology. So again, just quickly, uh, Forrester already uh, estimated 1.4 billion on spend in 2014 on online B2B transactions. And again, they think it's gonna uh, get to 2.1 billion by 2019. So again, interesting market for a technology company to get in. So what are the use cases when it comes to B2B? Just quickly, again, we have uh, the self-served model. So this is where a company sees that you have a website and you're selling online, and they're calling you and saying, hey guys, we wanna start buying from you uh, from your website. And you say, sure, no problem. Create an account, start buying. That's not an issue. But that's where it ends. Because as soon as you do that, the problem is that they'll say, yeah, but we have multiple users under a single account. How do we do that? And none of the e-commerce uh, solutions or B2C e-commerce solution will actually provide you tools to do that. And it's a very kind of complicated feature to start creating ability for other companies to buy from your website. So that will be the first use case. And don't believe me only. Amazon just released something called Amazon for Business. Amazon for Business is an, a way for businesses to buy on Amazon. So it, they don't tell businesses that want to buy from Amazon, just create one account and allow your users to share the login. Because these users need more control. They need to control who is a user. If they, somebody's uh, fired or let go, they want to delete them, right? If they want to control what payment options they're using, if they want to control what products they're buying, right? So Amazon identifies this as a big market segment from them, and they release this new product called Amazon for Business. I'm not sure if it's released in Europe yet, but it's definitely going to come. So that's the first use case, self-serve model online. The second one is buyer-seller kind of uh, approach. We talked about it. There's a negotiation of price. There's maybe submitting a request for quote. A quote submitted. We negotiate the price, and then we convert to order. And this today has to go online as well, right? People are, don't want to necessarily pick up the phone and do that over the phone. Uh, they don't want to hear how good the kid is doing at football, right? They want to put and uh, create these orders across multiple points, so they want to be efficient about it. The last one is a marketplace kind of the Alibaba style, where there's multiple merchants selling to multiple businesses, and there's a bidding going on and stuff like that. So these are the three main use cases that we kind of identify when it comes to B2B online e-commerce. Uh, at Aura, we're actually going to focus on the first two ones first, and Marketplace is coming next year. So for now, we are actually developing uh, to solve these two use cases that I listed, um, self-serve and buyer-seller. Okay, and just quickly again, market space, how it's the distributed uh, between total cost of ownership and flexibility. There's very, very few small players when it comes to B2B. So there's um, Cloud Craze is one of them, but it's built on top of Salesforce. So you have to have a, a Salesforce account to use that. And again, it's very not flexible. But if you want flexibility, there's some of the bigger players on the market. I'm sure you know some of them. Uh, Hybris here in Germany for sure. But these tend to be extremely expensive. We're talking about, you know, starting, I think, from our research, about 400,000 euros was the cheapest we can find. But to actually get an implementation going, about a million euros to get online uh, for a B2B application. And when it comes to um, the feature set that they're providing, they kind of neglected it for a while because they, the B2C world got so exciting. All these platforms kind of started investing in B2C. So a lot of these features for B2B were not updated. They're kind of the same old thing that they provided maybe 10 years ago. But you know, people are getting smarter. People are using the internet in a different ways. The front end becomes more uh, accessible, right? So we, we think that this needs some innovation. So with our commerce, again, no limit on flexibility and uh, price point, which is reasonable for the mid-market to actually really start adopting this. And we put Magento on the same level as flexibility as us. And we know Magento is extremely flexible. We created it. We know that. But we did not create it with B2B in mind. So a lot of the deep features that we'll cover in a sec are missing in uh, Magento. So the cost of ownership becomes pretty high because if you want to develop these features, you'll end up owning them, meaning that you'll have to maintain them and you won't benefit from using a platform on that. So the flexibility is there, but the cost of ownership will definitely be higher. And actually, surprising or not, a lot of the big players in the B2C space do not provide any kind of B2B uh, offering. So again, that's something the Forrester kind of did the research. Again, here's a list of uh, must-haves in a B2B kind of application. And uh, without this, you're basically going to create a lot of custom customizations if you use any other application. If you don't find this short list, you're probably going to do a lot of the heavy lifting on your own. So the good news is that we just released our first beta of Aura Commerce, and it's available. 
And we do have, for example, corporate account already built into the product. So you can do everything I said that Amazon does, you can provide today on your website. You can manage multiple users, multiple roles. You can have permissions for different roles. You can have budgets for different roles. You can uh, delete users, et cetera. And this is already built into the beta. Personalized catalogs. When it comes to B2B, some of the B2B catalogs have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of SKUs. But not, not like in the B2C world, you don't want to expose all your catalog to everybody all the time. You want to have that some accounts, some of your customers, see a portion that's relevant to them of your catalog. You don't want to just expose hundreds of thousands if it's not relevant for them. Moreover, maybe their users, they don't want to expose all their, uh, their users to all your products. They only want to see the products that are important for them. So personalized catalogs, again, built into our beta already. Multiple prices, this is like the heart of a B2B application. This is something that without this, you're, you're not, not going to be able to create a true B2B e-commerce. And this can use the full power of what we provided here or integrate with an ERP. That's how we build stuff. But the idea is that when it comes to multiple prices, you have to think about this feature from the grounds up. Because not only is it hard to uh, use it on the front end and it has to be performant, but even managing it has to be in a way that uh, allows your sales rep or, your, or if it's running pricing for your company to actually maintain them. Because again, we said catalogs can be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of SKUs. So imagine how many permutations of pricing you can get on this. It's infinite. So it has to be something that works efficiently, both on the front end and back end, and intuitive yet very useful for the sales rep to work with. And we have this multiple prices already built in. Quick order form is kind of a must have feature for uh, buying online, right? So a lot of platforms only do this and say they have B2B. But the problem with this, this is just the start, right? But this is a really good efficient way for creating very large with many line items uh, orders or requests for quotes in a very efficient way. So we do have it, but like I said, this is just the beginning. We actually take this to the other level. We actually create features that make it intuitive yet efficient way to order when it comes to B2B buyers online, right? It's not necessarily that they're going to just navigate around and click on nice images and add each individual cust uh, uh, product to an account. They, for example, have multiple shopping lists, so they can actually multitask. They can create the monthly recurring um, office supplies order, but they can also work on the Christmas party uh, list at the same time. So they can manage and multitask in the same. And we have this approach, again, for many, many more aspects of this front end. Um, and workflows. We touched about workflows, but this is how we have to treat everything in the system when it comes to B2B, because if you have multiple uh, accounts that are ordering from you, they will come with a set of requirements for you to actually sell to them. They might come and say, look, guys, I love that you have a selection of shipping address, but I don't allow my customers to select the shipping address. OK. Um, we have to approve every order above 1,000 euros. And a manager has to approve it. So they'll start coming to you with a set of requirements for them to actually shop online with you. So. Our, the approach of B2C where everybody has the same checkout and everybody thinks, oh, it's the most optimized and converting checkout doesn't apply necessarily to B2B. You have to actually be able to supply a different experience when it comes to checkout, when it comes to submitting a quote, when it comes to actually creating even a user. Different accounts will dictate to you how they want to work with your website, and we use our workflow for that. So you can have different checkout for different accounts, even for different users in the system. And that's very, really robust and very, very flexible. And this is just a schema of how this looks. And we're working now on actually making this uh, drag and drop. So even on the front end, some of the super users as your customers can actually create and manipulate some of these or update some of these workflows. So again, full list of uh, roadmap. So I know we're running out of time. So again, I won't go through all of it. Some of the interesting ones is that we actually have another persona in mind when we develop uh, B2B. And these are the sales people, the sales reps. They have to be able to use the system in a very efficient way, right? Because they are, might be the actual end users of the system, not even your customers. So we are building features for them so they can actually stand in front of a customer in a meeting and create a personalized catalog for them in front of them. They can create pricing for them. They can show them the catalog and select for them and with them. And they can submit orders right there and then. And that also crosses to mobile. Like every other industry, mobile is taking over, even into B2B. And you can imagine today how sales rep will understand with their iPads on a trade show, in the floor, or in the booth, and create a quote right there for a customer on an iPad. Or accept an order on a phone uh, by a buyer when he's driving home when he got a quote. So all this mobile is something that we definitely have to have. Multiple websites, multiple businesses, all these features are coming. 
So with that, just quick announcement on what we are actually more doing. So Oro Cloud is something we're investing in. It's part of our kind of um, uh, approach to deploy anywhere. And we're providing a very optimized uh, SaaS and PaaS environment for developers and uh, companies to build on top of the Oro tools in the cloud. Oro Karma's GA release is uh, actually, we were planning the end of the year, but we started moving much faster. So we're targeting now end of Q3 this year for our um, stable release. Pricing model, like I said, we keep it simple. Uh, same pricing regardless if you go on-premise or in our cloud. Starting price for B2B will be about $25,000 for the enterprise edition and free, of course, for the community edition. And we are working on our first Aurora B2B uh, event that uh, is going to be in Q1 next year in the US for now. So with that, thank you very much. You have, thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. So now it's time for your questions. So please raise your hands if you have any, and um, please introduce yourself briefly. Tell us who you are, where you're coming from. We're also curious to learn who you are. So, are there any questions from you guys? So self-explanatory. No one's is asking. Maybe you have a question to the audience. So, how many of you guys here actually uh, work with B two B or uh, create? Okay, so, and, and I find this to be right everywhere we go. It's like I said, it's something that was creeping up and a lot of businesses that were providing uh, solutions for B2C. A lot, a lot of uh, requirements started being more from B2B kind of companies, and I think this is the truth. So I think um, there's, a, there's a big void right now in the market, uh, specifically for the mid-market uh, to solve uh, the B2B problem right now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.